Well, let's get into What's Up Doc. Every week we spend some time with our friends, the experts in healthcare at Mercy Health, and this morning is no exception. This morning we're going to talk about interventional radiology, and we're going to spend some time with Dr. Raj Kakala. Doctor, good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm feeling great. How about you? Well, I have no complaints whatsoever. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Dr. Raj Kakarla. I'm the Chief of Interventional Radiology over at uh, Mercy Health. Um, I d initially did my training, including medical school, um, undergrad at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, took, uh, went over to Chicago for my residency and fellowship, completed my fellowship at uh, Rush uh, Hospital, and then um, was briefly a teaching attending at uh, Beaumont Hospital in Michigan, uh, teaching medical students, residents, and fellows. Um, and then I came back to private practice uh, in the Chicago area, um, happened to be doing some uh, locums work, uh, which is kind of like, you know, medical mercenary work um, over at uh, the old Rockford Memorial Hospital, uh, at which time I enjoyed the staff and the people here in Rockford so much that uh, I made the move to Rockford. And, uh, you know, that began my journey with Mercy. Uh, now I have the, you know, uh, great uh, opportunity to work with a couple of great uh, interventionalists who are my colleagues, and we really built the um, minimally invasive, interventional radiology basically is basically minimally invasive surgery, um, you know, um, department here in Rockford, which I'm very proud of because some of the interventions we do are basically semi-tertiary or university teaching level stuff. Um, that uh, weren't offered here um, in the past and probably not offered currently still um, in up to a 60-mile radius. So we're very proud of uh, the work we do here and very happy to help um, the people in the neighborhood here. For those not familiar with uh, the lexicon, uh, university-level um, procedure, what does that mean in, in, in reference to our hospitals here in town? Right. Um, so uh, in terms of minimally invasive treatment, um, both technology matters a lot and the skill level matters a lot because some of the minimally invasive treatments you know, have only been around, let's say, 10, 20 years, although they're you know, well-known and well-trained at university-level centers, um, especially among the metropolitan cities. Um, they may not have translated to smaller suburban communities or rural settings because both the technology is not there, um, you know, the smaller institution cannot afford them, um, or uh, they have not had the ability to attract some of the brain drain uh, from the major metropolitan centers where people are skilled to do some of the minimally invasive procedures. For example, you know, what used to involve cutting and, uh, you know, in, in major surgery and longer recovery time can be done without those, um, with utilizing CT and x-ray or just doing an angiogram for, for vascular surgery. Um, so some of that stuff requires special equipment, um, which the institution will have to acquire um, and train their staff, not just the doctors, but the ancillary staff, including the nurses and the technologists. So um, Mercy has helped us invest in that and, uh, you know, basically um, train some of our younger um, you know, technologists and uh, helped us um, they do a nationwide search um, to um, actually for me to find both of my colleagues. So you, so you guys have, uh, have brought you know a uh, world class procedure to, uh, to to the Rockford area. That that would be correct. Yeah, and we're actually currently involved in a you know multinational study for treatment of uh, pulmonary embolism, which is blood clots that travel to the lungs, and also for DVT, which is blood clots that develop in the veins. So we are among um, the institutions that were reached out to by uh, this study um, because we've done so many of them and actually some over um, a great, the greater number than uh, some of the institutions in Chicago, um, including the teaching institutions. Wow, outstanding. Doctor, you, you've used the term minimally invasive uh, a couple of times. And, uh, you know, I've seen advertisements for uh, different procedures. Minimally, minimally invasive, minimally invasive. Uh, describe Correct. that to us. Yeah, so um, what I mean by that is, like, we make Band-Aid size incisions. We don't cut, you know, the patient open. So minimally invasive could be a lot of things. For example, some general surgeons definitely do minimally invasive surgeries. That's called laparoscopic, where they put a scope um, in through a small hole uh, or an incision and then um, use robotic instruments to do perform surgery. What interventional radiology does is a little different. We use imaging 
whether it is a CT scan or an ultrasound or, you know, for blood vessels we, or an angiogram um, to basically um, aid us to get to the area where, you know, or the organ that has disease and um, able to treat it um, utilizing catheters or, um, you know, performing biopsies using ultrasound or CT um, or treating um, abscesses or infections by placing drains in them without having to actually cut anybody. So it, it, it makes it uh, easier on the patient and recovery time, I'm, I'm assuming, speeds up a lot. Absolutely. So um, for uh, most of our, um, you know, procedures, the recovery time is basically the same day. Uh, for most of our vascular procedures, we send the patients home on the same day within three, four hours. Uh, for some of the uh, patients that are sicker, we, you know, that are, have to be inpatient patients, um, the recovery time for, from our procedures are usually one to two days as opposed to, you know, prolonged recovery uh, that would keep the patient bedridden inpatient for weeks at a time. So, yeah, so let's, uh, let's rewind, uh, you know, 10, 15 years in the area. Uh, if, if somebody was coming to you for a procedure like you're describing right now, what would have happened to them 10, 15 years ago? 10, 15 years ago, um, they probably would have been sent to um, either Milwaukee or Chicago or Madison because at that time was um, basically when this field was just, um, you know, burgeoning. It was just coming to be uh, accepted, um, and the skill level of people that were training uh, was getting better and better at that time. So the field has been around, you know, probably since the 60s, um, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, in order to get expertise at more and more um, procedures and uh, as they were added on as the technology developed. So 10, 15 years ago, it was probably being done at the major metropolitan centers. If you're just joining us, uh, this is What's Up Doc, weekly segment that we do Thursdays here on WROK. Our guest is Dr. Raj Kakarna. He is uh, Chief of Interventional Radiology with Mercy Health. You had mentioned uh, blood clots and uh, DVT, which I um, guess deep vein thrombosis. Am I right? That's absolutely correct. Tell yes. me, tell me about those, and, and and what type of patients are more at risk for getting these? Right. So actually, that's a very good question. So deep vein thrombosis is when uh, people develop blood clots in the legs. Most often, the blood clots can develop in any vein in the body, including the upper extremity and the arms. But most often, people develop them in the legs. Um, usually, um, you know, patients that are a little more immobile. Let's say, um, you know. People talk about taking prolonged rides in the car or prolonged air flights. Yeah, that isn't one of the risk factors, um, you know, but most often people are less mobile than they used to be. Either they're because they're sick or they're not feeling well or they're just in bed or sometimes patients are inpatient. So those, that's a major risk factor, immobility, um, because when you're not walking, your calf and your muscles are not pushing on those veins to keep the blood moving along. And so when the blood slows down like that, it tends to clot. The other risk factors are people can have some clotting factor disorders that run in the families. So when people say, yes, I have, you know, I had an aunt or an uncle or, um, you know, or mom that, you know, had blood clots, usually their primary care physicians may work them up for, um, you know, a clotting factor disorder that runs in the families that you know, predisposes them to developing blood clots. The last case scenario um, could be someone um, that has a predisposition to developing blood clots because of the medications they may be on. For example, the oral contraceptives um, you know, that uh, young females may be taking um, sometimes predispose them to de uh, developing blood clots. Um, other things are um, you know, disease states such as cancer um, have a higher risk of developing blood clots. Who, uh, who comes to see you? How does somebody end up in front of you? Are, are, you, are you a first, uh, first visit or is it all referenced uh, to you from, from primary doctors? Very good question. So, you know, how blood clots were treated for a very long time in medicine, you know, has been giving blood thinners. So they usually go either to their primary care doctor or to the emergency room because they develop swelling in the legs. Now, that the blood clot that develops in those deep veins has a you know high chance if left untreated of uh, basically breaking off and going to the lungs, and that's called a pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolisms can be dangerous because they place a significant strain on the heart and lungs, um, and very rarely, if they're large enough, can cause death. So when the patients present early on with blood clots and it's recognized by doing an ultrasound. 
um, by either the primary care doctor or the emergency room doctor. They're usually put on blood thinners. Initially, while in the hospital, something like called heparin or lovenox, which is a you know, blood thinner that is given by IV um, or an injection. Or when they go home, uh, if, if a wide number of therapies, um, the old therapy was the warfarin, which actually was developed at the University of Wisconsin, um, or Coumadin. Um, or the newer blood thinning medications, which people know by their um, uh, you know, brand names, such as Aralto or Aliquis, if you'd see the advertisement for them sure. on television. So that was the way of treating blood clots. However, you know, the way blood clots are treated has changed significantly. And you know, there's a lot of um, uh, misinformation about that. And even in the medical realm, um, what people need to be educated on is the fact that not every blood clot is the same because blood clots that just develop, let's say, in the calf or just below the level of the thigh could probably be just treated by the this blood thinning medications we're talking about. However, if you have a large area of swelling and it's not getting better you know, very soon on the blood thinning medication within the week, more than likely the blood clot is you know, significant enough or extended to the larger veins that these leg veins drain into, into the pelvis. So those blood clots should actually be, you know, the, are the ones that present to me so, so we can perform, you know, some procedures to get them out because the blood thinning medications don't do anything to get those clots out. What they do is reduce your risk of making those clots worse and maybe reduce the risk of those clots breaking off and going to the lungs. However, they don't do anything for that clot that's just staying there. So the patients that come to me have significant amount of clot that is causing a lot of leg swelling because what happens is what's called post-thrombotic syndrome, where that swelling gets so bad that you start um, developing symptoms of venous stasis. Um, now, that's a kind of a big name. You know, what venous stasis is, basically the blood's not going anywhere, so it's kind of pooling in the leg and it's causing discoloration and worst-case scenario ulcers uh, and wounds in the legs. Okay, yeah, something to be uh, cognizant of and, and know that perhaps you need to reach out if you're experiencing any of these things. Doctor, Correct. before we let you go, uh, what is it when you walk away from the job at the end of the day you derive the most satisfaction from? You know, I actually love everything about my job, and that's kind of why I moved here, because my staff is excellent. They're very keen on learning new procedures. I always, now, currently we teach residents and medical students at Mercy, and the first thing I tell them is, Find a job that doesn't feel like a job because I love getting up in the morning and coming to work, you know, able to have basically immediate satisfaction because some of my patients, like, for example, the pulmonary embolism patients, when I'm able to get them off the table and it feels like you saved their lives, you know, those are very few procedures where you can walk away thinking that. As physicians, most of the time, you know, we don't have many procedures that we feel like that, but, um, you know, I'm... I'm happy enough to basically work at a place and do uh, the kind of work I do where I do have that satisfaction. He's Dr. Raj Kakarla. He is Chief of Interventional Radiology with uh, Mercy Health. Dr. Kakarla, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day. This has been very educational and informative, and uh, you know, we'd love to have you come back with us again. Well, thank you very much for having me.